and we will arrange so that people who require specialized stroke and STEMI care, which is provided at Seton, are safely transferred to the other hospitals that provide those services. AMR is also prepared to respond to Seton Coside. They are already familiar and, and routinely respond when needed to Seton Coside because that standby emergency department has minimal capabilities. And last year we transferred about 59 people um, who needed higher levels of care. We expect that the closure would result in diversion of patients and as Supervisor Canepa noted, um, I guess my number is from 2018, but about 23,000 patients, which is about 63 per day, uh, primarily to Mills Peninsula and to Kaiser South San Francisco, and adult trauma patients would continue to be transferred to Zuckerberg San Francisco General in San Francisco, and pediatric trauma patients would go, as they do already, to Stanford Hospital. The loss of Seton would primarily impact Medicare patients who are, Medicare patients are older adults who live in northern San Mateo County and in southern San Francisco County because Seton is a resource to people in the southern part of San Francisco. And the services that I mentioned before, but to recap are the emergency department, acute inpatient, skilled nursing, and outpatient care. The population in this service area is substantially Asian, 45%. The median age is 44 years, but older adults are the fastest growing segment of the population in North County. And as I mentioned, uh, a large percentage of Seton's patients are on Medicare, they're Medicare be beneficiaries. So that's 47% of the patients, and that's about 2,500 out of 5,400 discharges in 2018. And then there's a large group of Medi-Cal patients, people who are low income and qualify for Medi-Cal, or they may qualify as a result of their disability. That's about 17% of Seton's population. And so in 2018, that was just a little over 900 discharges from the hospital. It's true that in the past, Seton has been a, a provider of charity care or uninsured care to the community, but because of the Affordable Care Act, Many of the people that used to not have any insurance now are covered through Medi-Cal. So Seton is not a substantial provider of uh, services to people who are uninsured. And there are people who are, most people who get services at Seton are, have insurance coverage. It's also important to, for this community to note that at this point, Seton has about 13% of the market share uh, in this service area, which is the northern part of the county and the coast. That's the way to understand the service area for Seton. And that's because about two-thirds of this of Daly City zip code residents, they go to other hospitals already. And those hospitals primarily, as uh, has been noted, are, are the Sutter system, including Mills Peninsula Hospital, Kaiser San Francisco, the Kaiser system, and San Francisco hospitals, including UC. So you may know um, that the 357 licensed beds in the Daly City campus um, include 250 acute care beds. Um, 24 of those are licensed for gero psychiatry um, and 83 skilled nursing facility beds. The facility has operated at a low occupancy and that is one of the aspects of the financial challenge. It's been at a daily census of about 121. And then in addition, Seton Coside has 121 beds. That includes 116 nursing, skilled nursing beds and those are nearly always full. And at the main campus, the skilled nursing beds are also nearly always full. So the skilled nursing uh, beds really are at, are at capacity. In the event of a closure, uh, there appears to be capacity at other local hospitals to absorb the loss of Seton acute care beds. Not the, the skilled nursing beds, but the acute care beds. The average daily census in 2018 for med surge was about 66, and for intensive care it was about eight. 
The average med surge occupancy rate for hospitals in San Mateo County and San Francisco is about 54%. So many of our hospitals have available acute beds. Um, the Jero psych beds are a different matter. Seton chose to operate to open 24 Jero psych beds for acute psychiatry um, in the last couple of years. Initially, they were not substantially occupied, but more recently they have been. And Jero psych uh, specialty is not really available anywhere um, in the Bay Area um, to the extent it is available. It's offered to some degree by the Jewish Home for the Aged, uh, and it is offered at Fremont Hospital in the East Bay. But before Seton opened the Jero Psych specialty, the resources for older adults and psychiatry were the same as for adults. They went to the same hospitals. And those hospitals primarily are Mills Peninsula, my hospital, San Mateo Medical Center, San Francisco General Hospital, California Pacific Medical Center, and St. Francis. And if the, this unit closes, the system will again be trying to triage people back into those hospitals. There, there isn't a Jero psych resource. So I'm gonna just now turn my attention to the issue of skilled nursing, which we believe is really a large challenge if, if Seton closes. So there really are not a lot of skilled nursing facilities that are willing to serve low-income Medi-Cal beneficiaries. And that's really the challenge. And that would no doubt be worsened by the loss of skilled nursing beds on the main campus and at Seton Coast Side. So on the main campus, there are 83 what we call distinct part skilled nursing beds, and they're generally full. And of note, 44 of those are subacute, and that means that the patients in those beds have significant needs for ventilators, gastronomy tubes, and other supports. And there really are no other subacute skilled nursing beds in the Bay Area. So it's our expectation that if those beds were lost, the patients in those beds would be placed all around California. And that it would be Verity's responsibility to do that. And that would be very challenging. Um, at Seton Coastside, where the average daily census is 114, um, most of those patients are Medi-Cal beneficiaries, and there is little to no capacity for those patients at Bay Area facilities. We operate, or, or through a management agreement that we have, the largest other facility, which is Burlingame Skilled Nursing, and it's nearly always full, and they serve almost all Medi-Cal beneficiaries, but there aren't a lot of resources, so that's a challenge. And as I said, Verity has the responsibility to place all of these patients, and of course, um, the health plan and county health will be monitoring that situation and, and will assist. Um, now I wanna just to focus a little bit on some of the people who are associated with, with Seton. So uh, Seton's 480 or so medical staff physicians include numerous specialties. And the largest group is internal medicine, 129 physicians at the last I found that number. And so if Seton closes, those physicians may affiliate with other hospitals. Some of them already have. Um, some of them may choose to retire. And all of that process will involve disruption for the patients who are associated with those, yeah. with those physicians. Um, we've already seen that, actually, because over the past few years, there have already been changes in the service lines that have caused that kind of transition to be necessary. And, um, and it's very challenging for patients, and it's important not to underestimate that process. Um, we believe that there is demand for specialty capacity in the northern part of the county, and uh, that those uh, specialists, um, when they reconnect and the system can hopefully absorb, we hope, um, that the, the demand from the patients should lead to those specialists being absorbed into other systems if that happens, if there's a closure. Um, we are most concerned as a public system uh, in, in low-income people and what happens to people on Medi-Cal. That's really our particular focus. And the county's actual responsibility under Section 17,000 
is for people who are uninsured. So that's really our focus, and we'll be a partner to the health plan, whatever happens. We know the health plan has a very robust primary care network in North County, and Maya will say more about that. Um, we are less concerned about access to primary care in North County with Northeast Medical Services also nearby. We're also aware that urgent care uh, is a concern by the community and that has also um, is now present in Daly City. So that's, that's good. But um, we are concerned about access to specialty and ancillary services, especially for Medi-Cal beneficiaries. And where we have seen the greatest needs is, uh, and this I'm really speaking it from County Health's point of view, because we also run a delivery system that relies on specialists. And where we see the needs is with orthopedics, gastroenterology, endocrinology, pain management, and neurology. So um, to wrap up, um, the closure of Seton Medical Center and Seton Coastside would result in a loss for the community, and some services would likely not be replaced within San Mateo County. So not just within Daly City, but actually within the county. Uh, we will respond along with the health plan to assure that patients are safely transferred as that is necessary, but of course we're expecting that Verity will step up in that scenario. Um, uh, I also want to say that our hearts really go out to the employees um, who have worked tires, tirelessly to serve this community. Uh, our hearts go out to colleagues who have worked tirelessly over many decades to serve this institution. We know that healthcare is challenging, as I mentioned earlier. We're facing some very similar challenges in the county and we understand. And we know how hard it is each day while this facility and Seton Coastside remain open to do that important work of meeting people's needs when this kind of stress is in the environment and uncertainty. So I, I just want to express that in the event of a closure, we would want to partner as a county health organization um, around, um, you know, whether there's anything that we can do around supporting employees. Uh, we are also laying off staff um, and we will be engaged in that work ourselves. But we have jobs as well, and um, I'd like to make uh, some kind of a partnership happen in the event that all of that comes to be. But I think it's very important, as Supervisor Canepa pointed out, that um, although it's critical to face the potential loss, and that's what I was here to do, is to point out what some of the significant problems would be. Uh, in fact, um, you know, we don't want to detract from the day-to-day -day services or the potential for Verity to find another buyer. And uh, my goal was to simply share information in the event that that doesn't happen. So uh, I will turn it over now to Maya Altman to um, speak more specifically about the health plan and the Medicaid component of all of this. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. Appreciate it. Mike? There, now it's on. Um, so, uh, I'm Maya Altman, I'm the CEO of the Health Plan of San Mateo. Just on a personal note, I want to say I've, I've worked in this community since 1994, so I've been here a long time. Um, I used to work for the County Health Department, and I've been at the CEO of the Health Plan for 15 years, so I've worked with many um, administrations at Seton, and I've always had a, uh, a great working partnership with the hospital and the staff. Uh, so the Health Plan of San Mateo, for those of you who don't know, is the county's Medi-Cal managed care plan. And we're the single Medi-Cal managed care plan in the county. Just about everybody who's on Medi-Cal in San Mateo County is our member. There's some exceptions, so people who, um, sometimes people qualify for Medi-Cal because of an emergency. And then that's just a brief qualification, um, it's mainly undocumented people. Um, but generally, we are responsible for providing access to services for people on Medi-Cal. We're responsible to the state. We have a contract with the state, and they oversee us um, very closely on that. So um, I want to summarize some of the challenges facing our members um, if Seton were to cease operating. Uh, Louise has already covered a lot of the points, so I'll be brief. I'll just um, add a little bit to some of the points that, that she made. Um, as far as um, just to, uh, where we are now, Seton um, uh, is not a, a big as, 
as big a provider um, to our Medi-Cal members as it used to be. So right now in uh, 2019, um, I checked the statistics today, and about 8.5% of our Medi-Cal members um, are hospitalized at Seton and inpatient. So Seton is the fifth highest volume hospital for us. Um, uh, 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 Stanford and Lucille Packard and the County Medical Center and uh, Mills Peninsula have a higher volume of our Medi-Cal patients, at least as of right now. Um, as Louise said, we do believe there is capacity um, with a 50% occupancy rate across hospitals in San Mateo County and San Francisco. We contract with all the hospitals um, in those two places we believe we'll be able to find help Verity, because we are, as Louise said, holding Verity responsible as the provider, but that we will be able to um, find placements for people in other hospitals and that there is capacity for the inpatient care on an ongoing basis. We're really, really worried about the subacute um, patients, as Louise said. Uh, uh, this, these are people who are ventilator dependent for the most part. Um, we think it'll be really difficult to find placements for them and it will probably be uh, in places that are far from the county and far from their families and loved ones. So we think that is really uh, a deep, con that is very a deep concern to us. Um, they're really all our members, they're all on Medi-Cal. The other area we're, we're very concerned about is the skilled nursing facility and I, I cannot, I mean I've spent years talking to my commission about the, the growing crisis in skilled nursing facilities in this county. Um, the capacity has been declining over the years and not just in San Mateo County but in San Francisco and Santa Clara counties as well. It is di very difficult to place um, patients, particularly Medicaid patients in skilled nursing facilities. Um, so the loss of uh, 116 beds at Seton Coastside and uh, roughly 39 beds at, um, at Bob Daly City Campus is, is of great concern to us. Um, the occupancy rate for skilled nursing facilities is 95%. So that just shows you how, um, um, how scarce that resource is. Again, nearly all these um, beds are filled by our members. They're Medi-Cal Medi members. Um, I just wanted to say also that we do have contracts with uh, nursing facilities all around the Bay Area. So, um, and we, again, we would hold Verity responsible, but we would um, assist as much as we can uh, in finding place, helping them find placements for patients. But the ongoing need is something of great concern. Uh, specialty physician services. Um, a seat enclosure would really exacerbate the access issues for Medi-Cal members in need of specialty services. Um, in North County, um, we have the same needs as, uh, as Louise uh, um, listed. Um, the areas of greatest need are orthopedic, gastroenterology, endocrinology, pain management, and neurology. Um, we will work with uh, San Mateo County Health and other providers, including NEMS, which is a large community health center system in San Francisco that I house at clinic in Daly City as well. And they provide a, a lot of specialty care. We would work with them and Palo Medic Foundation and Dignity to, uh, to, tr to try to address the specialty, specialty care gaps. I did want to point out, though, that we just uh, uh, a few weeks ago received the state's annual uh, timely access survey. Um, which measures, um, it's done for all plans, not just Medi-Cal, but all um, plant health plans in California. And the health plan San Mateo ranked fourth in the state for access um, across all provider types, which is primary care, specialty care, mental health, and ancillary services for both urgent and non-urgent appointments. So relatively speaking, we're starting from a place where we have pretty good access um, in this county relative to a lot of other places. Um, Louise, as Louise mentioned, in primary care, we do have a, a robust uh, primary care network in the northern part of the county. It's always been the area of the county where we have had the most Medi-Cal capacity because we have a wonderful community of private physicians who um, see it as part of their uh, civic duty to see Medi-Cal patients, and they see a lot of our patients. Um, NAMS opened a clinic in 20, 2011, which is really helpful as well. So we've uh, 
done some recent work looking at our primary care capacity, and we have more than 12,000 slots of open capacity, which means over 50% of our contracted capacity, or 66 of 123 practices, are open to new members, so we are not concerned about primary care access. Um, the other things that, that we are ready to do and that we can do um, in event of a closure is we have, um, in recent years, a couple years ago, the state extended a transportation benefit to all Medi-Cal um, recipients across the state. So what that means is anybody on Medi-Cal uh, can call us and we will arrange and pay for transportation to a Medi-Cal funded service. So a doctor's appointment, a doctor's visit, uh, pick up your pharmacy, uh, medication at the pharmacy, an urgent care visit, anything that is covered by Medi-Cal, we will uh, arrange for transportation. Um, we also have a program uh, where we have doctors and nurse practitioners who can visit people at home, and this is targeted to really chronically ill and frail patients, um, but we would have that service available. Um, Louise mentioned the, the urgent care facility, which we're contracted with in Daly City. Um, um, we can help people find a doctor. Um, um, we can help find alternatives. We've been working hard to find alternatives to living in a nursing home. Um, you know, we've moved about 300 people out of nursing homes over the last few years, and we're continuing to try to work on that, so um, really keep that scarce resource for people who, who really need it. And then, of course, we would be prepared to do, along with, you know, coordinating with the health department, um, a, uh, a, a, a public information campaign and notifying all our members and about our services and what's available to them. Um, I want to echo um, Louise's uh, comments about, you know, I remain hopeful that um, there will, that a buyer will be found. Um, we realize this is an in, um, uh, incredibly difficult situation for uh, the staff and the patients and, uh, um, um, and the community, so we are ready to do everything we can to help. Thank you, Ms. Altman. Thank you, Ms. Rogers. <clears throat> I don't know how Daily City did it, but we are now streaming live on Peninsula TV, and I'm going to give you the address if you want to text some friends that may not have been able to get here tonight, but if they go to Penn TV, dot tv our meeting is now being streamed live that's good news thank you daily city now with that we'll do public comment sure mr president first speaker we have is deborah amore from cna um, followed by peter burnoff i may not have mentioned but each speaker is going to get two minutes which is the customary um, amount of time that we do and is this first speaker moving to, where do they go? Uh, right here, Mr. President, right in the front. Oh, the podium. Yes, okay. at the podium. So you want to come to the podium. Hi. My name is Deborah Amor. I've been a nurse at Seton Hospital for over 25 years. I've been actually a nurse for about 30 years. And it's in my professional opinion that to close Seton at this time is a huge mistake, especially with the coronavirus. We're in the middle of what's going to be a pandemic, and yet Barry wants to close us. And one thing I would really like to say is shame on you. Yeah.
respond to that, and you have to respond to it quickly. I live in, I live in um, near Seton Coastside, actually. I live in El Granada. You cannot get to a hospital within 40 minutes. Your brain will be gone. You will have to Thank you. Thank you for the comments. from SCM, followed by Mayor Gunn Sylvester from Dilly City. Thank you, supervisors, for doing this tonight. My name is Peter Baranoff. I'm the CEO of Strategic Global Management, the bidder, original bidder, the stalking horse and approved by the bankruptcy court to acquire the hospitals for. Unfortunately, I'm not here tonight to discuss matters of litigation that are between us and Verity. But I am here tonight to tell you that we have made a bid for Seton and Seton Coastside, a bid of $60 million, and we are prepared to do more. It was always our desire to keep these hospitals open and to expand the healthcare campus. Healthcare is local. Healthcare is not visiting your loved ones far away. Healthcare is expanding services. We are very appreciative of the opportunity to meet with the health plan of San Mateo and create a strategy for the future. We've met with numerous doctors, employees, others. We would like to see that there be an auction process or a private sale process so that our bid and the other bid or others bid could all be discussed, reviewed, and if an auction, may the best bid, the best provider win. We serve Medi-Cal patients throughout three counties in Southern California and certainly understand the Medi-Cal business, the SNF business, and the various businesses Louise and Maya spoke about. But there's got to be a process here, supervisors. We ask you to implore upon Verity to do so. We've had no dialogue about our bid, and we ask Verity to sit down with us, the others, and let something occur here where this, these hospitals can stay open. Thank you. Thank you. Before, from Dilly City. Uh, Mayor, yes, sir. before you go, could we ask a question of the last speaker? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, and thank you for uh, being here and for informing us that uh, you have made, made this bid. Um, uh, would your, would is your bid, um, would you be willing to operate Seton under the Yes, we, we were part of negotiating the Attorney General conditions, and we would do so, and I have our bid in our pocket. I also have a substantiation that I shared with Supervisor Canada of our financial wherewithal to do so without obtaining any outside finance. So we're open to a process that falls in various courts we need your help. And then one, one other question, if I may. Um, you know, one of the fundamental challenges facing Seton is its, is its patient mix with Medi-Cal and Medicare. And unfortunately, we live in a country where um, we do not, uh, the federal government does not pay and reimburse uh, hospitals adequately, remotely adequately, for providing uh, services to people on Medi-Cal. Travesty for the only modern country that treats uh, its residents and citizens this way. So I've watched for eight or ten years the struggles of operators to try to make it work given that patient mix. And um, how are you going to do it? A few different ways. One, we're certainly going to look to expand the commercial patient base and not be solely dependent on the Medi-Cal population and what Maya and her team does. And we've had discussions concerning that. We also plan to engage ourselves with something we've done in our other hospitals. 
Remember, our other hospitals are safety net hospitals that deal with Medi-Cal populations. However, you can't survive on just that. You've got to have partnerships with physician associations called IPAs. You've got to create commercial contracts with those types of folks out there. Unfortunately, Verity, Verity has not done that well in recent times, and the financial conditions as stated are pretty obvious. You know, unfortunately, hospitals are closing nationwide in communities. Hadamon Hospital in Philadelphia, Tri-City Hospital in Hawaiian Gardens, other hospitals that have closed have not been willing to look at how they take advantage of what the marketplace is. And there are hospitals that do well. We see an opportunity on this campus not only to expand subacute, but we also see creating a teaching hospital. There are two wonderful office buildings on these, on these campuses that are about 35% empty. We, we have in our hospitals graduate medical education programs with doctors who are called residents on their way to be physicians. We see that expanding here. And we just want an opportunity to keep them open. And that makes this one final question. And uh, we also know that Seton faces uh, a lot of seismic, uh, you know, needs for seismic upgrades, and time is ticking on those on those deadlines. There is. And uh, what are your thoughts on how you would approach that? Well, there are some plans in place to approach that via a program that's been set up called the PACE program through property taxes. We're going to take a look at that, but being seismic compliant would be a top priority of ours, and also making some changes to the general layout and making it a little bit more appealing for the community. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Supervisors. Mr. President, I hope you're enjoying that seat because it's a very I love this seat, one. Mayor. <laughs> but they all feel the same. I uh, just wanted to let you know, I think uh, Supervisor Canepa touched on it because I wanted to bring up a few points. That is full and complete transparency. You know, for 33 years in public service as a police officer, uh, you have to react to a situation sometimes within seconds. This is not the particular case here because we've been at this for many, many months. I want to read something to the public regarding Seton Hospital and zoning that was graciously provided to me by our city manager. For those who don't know, Seton occupies a 32-acre site in Daly City. The site has been zoned as a hospital since 1965. Currently, the Seton site is within the Sur Sullivan Corridor Specific Plan and has a specific plan use designation of hospital. And I'll go on to say back in September 24, 2018, under the leadership of then Mayor Jesslyn Manalo, the City Council adopted a resolution that resolved to inform any potential buyers of the Seton Hospital site that the City has no plans to change the hospital land use and zoning designation. If a developer wanted to change the land use and zoning de designations for the site, they would have to select from the land use designations identified and such a change would be at the full discretion of the City Council. Since the City Council has explicitly stated that it is a full service acute care hospital remains at the site, they have not discussed or considered other land use scenarios for the site. So, uh, thank you Penn TV for putting this up for others to see. And after hearing about that, I would feel very, I hope that there aren't the old folk who are under acute care listening today. Ms. Rogers, you have provided a breath of fresh hope. Because if I was one of those acute care patients, I'd say, let me go. I don't want to be a burden. And they don't deserve that. So, it is unbeknownst to me, and I just learned that Seton may be closing within a week. And today, tonight, I heard maybe even a few days. Who are the buyers? We had one who just uh, appeared. But why haven't we received the full transparency to make this work? And in closing, 
I'm about to close. Uh, I just need a couple more seconds. As a police officer, I believe in the three F's. So if you stop someone for a traffic violation, feel, felt, found. It all depends on how you talk to folks. I feel what you're feeling. I felt that if you do this, perhaps it might be better. And I find if I give you a citation, you might be a better driver. If I don't give you a citation, you'll have a great day. <laughs> so as for this process that's going on here, feel felt fine and put yourself in the other folks' shoes, especially all the workers here at Seaton Hospital. This is our hospital here in Bay City. And we won't forget that you have the full co commitment of the city council. Thank you so much. <laughs> MC followed by Phoebe Minkler and then L Lang Lam. Good evening, Supervisors. My name is Eric Tuckman. I am the Senior Advisor to the Chairman of the Board of AHMC Healthcare. AHMC Healthcare is an eight hospital integrated delivery system in Southern California that primarily takes care of safety net patients. It also has affiliated with it a nursing home, an assisted living facility, and a 40,000 live Medicare Advantage plan. We have been very successful in taking care of Medicaid patients in Southern California and have served communities that had previously had difficulties by nonprofit hospital operators taking care of their hospitals. Uh, we were solicited by Verity to submit a proposal for the acquisition of Seton, which we did at the latter part of February. We confirmed it in writing on February 25th and have uh, expressed a desire to engage with them in some discussions about the acquisition of the hospital. Today at 3 o'clock, I got a phone call from Verity's Bankers inviting me to participate in such a discussion, and we will do so probably tomorrow. Um, contrary to other participants, we have signed a non disclosure agreement, so we are precluded from discussing some of the details. But since this is public record, I want you to know that we are committed to finding a way to save this community hospital. I spent 40 years. I spent 40 years in healthcare, starting in Linwood, California, Inglewood, California, and then in Orange County, and now in Southern California throughout, taking care of patients of uh, low income, patients who have ethnic backgrounds that require specialized care. HMC serves a large population of Asian, uh, Asian patients. Uh, many people believe we are primarily an Asian hospital system, but we take care of a lot of Hispanic patients in Hispanic communities, as well as uh, numerous patients that have, uh, are either uninsured or underinsured. So we look to participate, and I'm open to having a discussion to the extent that I have freedom to have some details discussed with you. Thank you for this comment. Mr. Canifer, I have a question or a comment. Do you have a, a question first? Why don't you go ahead, I'll defer to you and then... Well, I, I was going to um, ask you the same question that I asked the prior gentleman, um, if I may, if you're able to respond. Sure. The first being, would you be prepared to operate seeking under the existing Attorney General's Yes, and in fact... Can you hear me? Can you hear me? In fact... Um, AHMC Healthcare, AHMC Healthcare has acquired three nonprofit hospitals in the last few years, all with Attorney General approval. We acquired from a CHW, St. Gabriel Medical Center. We acquired from Memorial Care, uh, Anaheim Memorial. And just this July, we acquired Parkview uh, Community Hospital in Riverside, which was uh, about ready to fail. And we uh, got Attorney General approval in July. And we take care of predominantly government patients. So we, are, we have a delivery system. I often tell people that many of the hospital systems talk about being involved in population health. AHMC is fully integrated. It does population health. It doesn't have to learn how to do it. It has an affiliated medical group, allied independent physicians that are our partners that we work with closely. So we take care of patients on a value-based basis and, if, and through capitation. So we're able to do that. And it's not all about putting heads in beds. It's about taking care of patients and keeping them healthy. My second three question was, how would you uh, make uh, seeing a success, you know, given the challenge of its patient mix? 
I, I don't think the patient mix is necessarily a problem because we have those mixes in our other hospitals. It's about the, it's about the, the, the model of care and the delivery of care, and it's about the cost structure you have when you, do, when you run a system and making sure your cost structure is capable to take care of the level of reimbursement you have. But um, we don't have a hesitation about taking care of Medicaid and Medi-Cal, Medicaid, Medicaid and Medicare patients. That's what we do take care of, and we have a, a system of care to, of delivery to do that. And a very, very strong primary care relationship with the independent uh, P IPAs. And finally, uh, how would you approach the seismic uh, challenges facing uh Seton today? The seismic challenges are significant because of the relationship that Seton has with Oshpod, and they have to be discussed. We've looked at them. We think there are, we can uh, comply with them. We would open discussions with Oshpod to make sure that they were comfortable with our time frame. They now have an April 1st deadline, but I'm sure they will work with us. Oshpod is yet to close a hospital in California because of seismic issues. They have worked with everybody to try to make sure that the last thing they do is deprive a community of its access because of earthquake issues. But we have to make that commitment, and we will. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Canada. Thank you. You know, I, I do want to be respectful. It's okay. Um, I do want to be respectful to Sam Mizell and, and, and Verity. I did allow those, you know, we allowed those folks to, to come up and spot, come up and speak. Would you like to c come up and address some of these uh, these issues? Please be, please come up, Mr. Mizell. You like to go last. Okay. Um, <laughs> I have a couple questions for you. Can you come up briefly and then you can make your closing comments? Thank you. Sam Mazel, Denton's US LLP, and I represent Verity and its bankruptcy case. Okay. You know, I just have, I have a couple questions. You heard um, a couple speakers um, saying that they're interested in buying the hospital, and they said that they've submitted bids. Um, can you speak to that uh, generally? Yeah, sure. They, uh, as you know, and as everyone in this room knows, the Verity Board has struggled to keep these hospitals open and to sell them as going concerns for over 18 months in bankruptcy. These hospitals have been struggling to stay open for over a decade. The Daughters of Charity tried to transfer them. They looked for buyers. They tried to sell them to Prime. They transferred them to Blue Mountain, Blue Mountain transferred them to Integrity, then they created uh, Verity Health System, a not-for-profit corporation, which has no ownership. Patrick Soon Shung has no connection to the company now, uh, except as one of thousands of creditors. The board has struggled to find buyers. It's interesting to hear Mr. Baranoff talk about their interest in acquiring these assets, it reminded me of the exact same comments he made at the public meetings here in Daly City in the context of their failed acquisition uh, over the last year. It, we heard the same things and they did not close and I won't go further now because we are in litigation with them, but they didn't close when they said they wanted to keep the hospitals open then and we would have concerns about any suggestion of their interest in acquiring the assets now for the same reasons. We, as represented from AHMC said, we are in conversations now because we do want to keep these hospitals open. But these hosp this hospital loses, was subsidized by the company $60 million in losses last year. The discussion you heard about the care they provide here, the quality of the staff, no one disputes that. The problem is neither this county, nor the board, nor others have the money to sustain the losses here. What you hear here, I, I've spent 20 years working with financially distressed hospitals. That's what I do. What you hear, what I hear when I hear these comments, and the comments I know I'm going to hear from the nurses, that's an indictment of how we deliver health care in America. The problem is I can't fix it. The Verity Board can't fix it. The Bankruptcy Court can't fix it. So, you know, that's a long answer to your question of do we want to keep the hospitals open? We do. We're still in discussions. But 
someone has to pay the losses. I mean, in Santa Clara County, they wanted the two hospitals, and they had the wherewithal to step up and buy the hospitals to preserve them for the health care system in Santa Clara County. That apparently is not an option here. That's unfortunate, but somehow sixty million dollars. I just interrupt you. I don't think you, you can say that um, right now. That's that's that that may not be accurate. You don't know that. That's, so that's you know, I, I would just caution you with your words, okay? And so let, let me ask you a couple questions, okay? Mr. Mizell, Mr. Mizell, I just have a couple questions, okay? So um, you had talked about closure. You, your board had taken took an action yesterday, Tuesday, and um, I didn't say that. No, no, I'm saying it. So they, you, you had taken action in Los Angeles, and then you you met with the um, the Verity board, or excuse me, the Seaton board, at 5 p.m. yesterday. That's true, right? I, I I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we, we do need to get through this. So you know that I cannot talk to you or the audience or anyone about attorney-client privilege communications. I, I have ethical obligations as a member of the state bar. I can't do what you're asking me to do. No, I just um, I just heard there was a meeting yesterday, and there were board members that were invited. But really, I just I just want to ask you something, Mr. Mizell, and hopefully um, you talk about ethics and being truthful. Um, there's a rumor the hospital is going to close on that Monday, and that you're going to file something on the court on Tuesday. Do you have any knowledge of that? I can't answer questions. <laughs> Can't answer questions. About you know, to, to be quite frank with you, it, it's it's not entertaining, you know. And for you to stay up, stand up there and say it's entertaining, you, it's pretty it's pretty disingenuous of you. For so for you, you to know, set me up like this, no, knowing I can't no, answer. No, I'm not questions. I'm not setting you up like that. You set yourself up that, and so, so did Dr. Patrick Sushiyong. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Mr. Campo. Thank you, Mr. Lassell. Next speaker, please. I uh, just want to make a quick announcement. We're, we're joined. I think my glasses serve me right. I think this is Scott uh, Senator Scott Wiener down here in front of me. Yeah. Our next speaker is Phoebe Minkler, followed by Lang Lam, and then Michelle Kubuda. Yes. Se Senator, Senator, excuse me, just a second. Did you want to speak? Yeah, okay, when you're ready. Hello, my name is Phoebe Minkler. I'm an RN at Seton Medical Center in the ICU. I've been there for almost 10 years. I'm also a member of CNA. I'm also a member of the bargaining team who sat across the table while we were trying to bargain uh, with a new contract with KBC last year. I have nothing prepared written other than I'm just completely appalled. And I want to just correct Ms. Rogers on one fact, and that is Barry did not close St. Vincent in an appropriate fashion. Per the law, you're supposed to give 90 days notice if you're going to have a planned closure to an emergency room. They closed that hospital in two and a half weeks. They did not give them the 90 days notice to those patients, staff. I'm not saying they didn't place those patients correctly, but they did not give the 90 days notice. I just wanted to make sure. Everybody... I agree. Um, and for your information, we sent a communication uh, in 2018 to Seton Hospital to remind them of this requirement and to ask for information. And we have sent that communication again. And it is true, there's a 90-day requirement and it, that it wasn't observed. My focus was primarily on the, how the patients were transferred, but I can't argue with what you're saying. No, thank you. I just wanted to make sure and bring that up. So there's just so many things that are wrong about this, that in a community that is one of the wealthiest communities in this country that we cannot provide health care to our patients. And I will just tell you that I can see patients dying every day. We already take care of tons of Kaiser's patients because they don't have a STEMI center at Kaiser South City, which is the closest emergency room to us. They have tons and hundreds of thousands of hours of diversion hours every year. I would just ask 
that everything be done and that Verity is not allowed to continue their slimy business practices and close us if there are other potential viable buyers to buy us and keep us open. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Senator, sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, Supervisor, thank you for uh, holding this hearing and for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. Uh, and I want to particularly uh, uh, really thank and recognize Supervisor Canepa for his extraordinary leadership, um, as well as uh, from, I know there are city council members here uh, tonight from Delhi City and Colma. Uh, and it's been truly a, a group effort. Uh, and I'll be honest, this is extremely uh, frustrating. Uh, we're in a, an era where we need more hospitals, not fewer hospitals. We need more safety net uh, healthcare services, not less. Uh, and what's happening here uh, is unacceptable. Um, I do have a, uh, a joint statement uh, from myself, uh, from Assemblymember Phil Ting, uh, from Senator Jerry Hill and from Assemblymember Kevin Mullen, which, with, with your permission, I'd like to read. Um, okay, so here is uh, this joint statement. Uh, quote, uh, Verity Health System's decision to close these two facilities will have a terrible impact on our communities in the southern part of San Francisco and northern San Mateo County. Uh, with uh, the coronavirus posing a public health challenge and our homelessness crisis worsening, uh, both of which are increasing trips to the ER. Uh, the closure of Seton Medical Center in Delhi City in particular is a huge problem for our community now and going forward into the future. Uh, we demand that Verity follow state law mandating that they provide 90-day notice when shutting down an emergency room. Uh, we further demand that they uh, follow the 30-day requirement for Seton Coast Side and Moss Beach. With the nearest hospitals now further away from Delhi City, if this closure happens, it's possible that patients will not get timely care because of additional travel time. We are also concerned that nearby facilities will become overcrowded, particularly during a public health emergency. Uh, we will continue to work with local health departments to ensure that residents will have access to affordable health care. Uh, now is not the time to close down a hospital, and we ask Verity to reverse this decision. Uh, I also just want to close by saying uh, this does not have to happen. This hospital can be sold, it can be kept open, it can keep providing critical health care safety net services to the community, and this is just horrendous what's happening, and Verity needs to shift course and keep this hospital open. Thank you. Sure. Next speaker is Lance Lem, followed by Michelle Kubota, and then Zeni Cortez. Hi, my name is Lancey Lem, and currently I'm a registered nurse at Seton Medical Center on the telemetry unit and a member of the CNA. I have been a nurse for three and a half years now, and I have been working at Seton for a little over three years. Although my years have been less, similar to my fellow colleagues, my whole nursing career has been at Seton Medical Center. Closing scene will be closing access to immediate health care in the surrounding area that sits between San Francisco General and Mills Peninsula. The community will not have access to immediate ER services as the only hospitals in between is Kaiser, and Kaiser functions primarily for the benefit of its health plan members. We are a very vulnerable community that we treat here at Seton, as 57% of patients are either Medicare or Medi-Cal recipients. On my unit, we receive patients that are here for stroke and recent heart attacks or chest pain and many other chronic illnesses. If our ED were to close, the treatment of patients with life-threatening illnesses will be delayed and mortality rates would increase. I cannot imagine the impact of an ED closure to this community. Not only will it be devastating, but lives will be at stake. I had, actually had a patient the other day who works at Redwood City. He had some neck stiffness and went to the nearby hospital, but they sent him home. When he got home, he knew something wasn't right and came to our ER. Turns out he was having a massive heart attack and ended up in the cath lab and then the OR for open heart surgery. If our ED was closed, he would not have been treated right away and may have even died. He's only 47 and his 11 and 15 year old children would have lost their father. 
Closing scene would have lo closing scene and our ER services will be closing the ability to treat stroke patients and patients with a heart attack in a timely manner. The community would have increase in deaths that could have been preventable. We are not talking about jobs. We are not just talking about jobs that will be lost from the closure of Seton, but lives of human beings that would have been lost. We demand from the district supervisors to keep our location to be a hospital zone only. We need the protection from you guys so that Seton can be saved and that the community can be saved. Thank you. speakers. Next is Michelle Kubota, followed by Zenny Cortez and then Gurley McCraig. Hi, my name is Michelle Kubota. I've been working for Seton for about 20 years now. If you look in front of you, majority of these nurses and staff, raise your hand if you've worked here for more than 10 years, more than 15 years, more than 20 years. Very, I, I, I wrote a whole speech, but I'm just going to put that on the side and just speak from the heart. Thank you, everyone. You, you know, we barely, knowing that we are on bankruptcy, we all did our best to care for our patients. When they say give high quality care, we give high quality care. We don't have enough clinics, but we'll make through the day. We will take care of those patients. I did take care of that patient that Lancy was talking about, the 47 years old. If without our ER, without our, our cardiac health department, without the nurses that's taking care of these patients, that that the, those kids would lose their, would have lost their dad. So, to Verity, please just be mindful of all the patients that we're taking care of, the nurses that's been, take, been taking care of these patients for the longest time. These are not just co-workers, we're all family. We've been together for so long, we're still with Seton, even if we know that the future is so unsure, because we know Seton gives the best here in the Bay Area. Right. For all of you, I know promises is overrated, but give us your promises. Keep our hospital open. Our patients need us. Our staff needs us. The community needs us. We love our job. We love our community, and we would love to continue to care for this community. Thank you. Next speaker. Denny Cortez, followed by Gurley McCraig, and then Kevin Vu. Good evening. My name is Zenny Cortez. I've been an RN for four decades. I work at Kaiser Permanente, in the closest hospital to Seton. We know that there have been viable beaters for Seton, and yet Verity continues to fail the community. Just for the record, Kaiser South San Francisco is in the 96th percentile statewide for diversion hours in 2018. Lives are already being put at risk and diversion hours will only worsen with Seton's closure. Seton Medical Center in Daly City is the largest employer. The closure would impact the community immensely. We need all of you, our elected officials, to work with us to do everything possible to not let this happen. San Mateo County needs to quickly explore all options to ensure vital services to the county residents are not put at risk. We know that tens of thousands of patients from San Mateo and South San Francisco rely on Seton, and the closure would put lives at risk, especially during this pandemic. We know that St. Vincent's immediate closure was reckless and may happen to Seton. As patient advocates, we will not stand by while Verity devastates another community. We need to all work together to ensure this does not happen. Our Seton Coalition of Nurses, healthcare staff from NUHW, and Engineers Union, doctors and elected officials will demand that Verity do the right thing keep Seton Hospital open, and lives will not be lost. Thank you. Followed by Kevin Wu, and then Teresita Golitan. And I just want to show you, these are the few notes that patients sent us. 
to thank the care of our doctors, the best care, uh, the heart doctors, the GI doctors. So these are the, they're taller than me. I can't bring any more because then you won't see me. So please, give, very me, please give us some hope, show us some miracle so that we can work here at Seton Medical Center. Thank you. Teresita Golatan, then Felix Milhouse. Hello. Hello, my name is Kevin Wu, and I'm a night shift nurse at the Geriatric Behavioral Health Unit at Seton Medical Center and with CNA. As a night shift nurse, oftentimes I'm unable to sleep during the day, like some of my patients can't at night during their manic episodes. For instance, one of my patients covered herself in blueberry yogurt and insisted on carrying a leaking garbage bin. And as we tried to redirect her back into her room and reclaim the garbage bin, she became verbally threatening and started kicking at us. Other patients of mine have OD'd on pills because they just lost their spouse of 50 years plus, just one month prior to their suicide attempt. Sometimes I wonder whether one of my parents will end up in a place like this as one of them, one of them will die before the other. Where will they go if there are no places like Seton Medical Center? Seton's closure will put lives at risk, and with the looming pandemic, Verity's actions or lack thereof are reckless and without regard for the community they promised to serve. Board of Supervisors, I urge you to protect what is left of our crumbling health care system and do all that you can to save Seton Medical Center. We need you to continue to lead where others have failed and ensure our safety net hospital continues to serve San Mateo County residents. We need more than a study session. What other options do we have? Thank you very much. Teresita Golito. Teresita Golito. Okay. Felix Milhouse. And then Dr. Tom Hazelhurst. to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Felix Milhouse and I've been the medical director of the, the cardiac cath lab at Seton Medical Center for, since 1994. Uh, Seton has been one of the leaders in establishing the efficiency of cardiac care for heart attacks. The, there are several parameters by which we are judged nationally and we do very well at Seton, by, at Seton Medical Center. The very first one is when somebody walks in the emergency room how long till you get that blood vessel open now? All of the hospitals in San Mateo County have very good results. The difference is what we call the onset of the symptoms until the vessel gets opened up. The parameters that decide that are what kind of uh, emergency medical care do you have? We have very good EMS people, but um, not all of them come by EMS. A large number of people at Seton come walk into the emergency room with their heart attack. Delays in transportation are one of the biggest causes of increase in death from on onset to balloon dilatation. The distance transportation is a very obvious factor. Seton Medical Center receives 43% of the heart attacks in San Mateo County. 43%. 73% uh, of the heart attacks that we get at Seton Medical Center walk in our door, whereas the rest of the county is 37%. That's a big difference in the patient population. The thing that we know for sure is that if Seton Medical Center is closed for cardiac emergencies, there will be an increase in mortality, people dying from cardiac disease, there will be an increase in morbidity, and what that translates to is more expensive health care. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Dr. Tom Hazelhurst, followed by Mary. Silovsky, sorry. Good evening, Board of Supervisors. Thank you so much. Um, Maya and Louise, terrific presentations. I am Dr. Tom Hazelhurst, and I'm the medical director for the post acute care beds 199 at Seton Medical Center and Seton Coast Side. And I would say that uh, the other thing I'd like to say is I'd like to thank Dr. Milhouse because 
I wouldn't be standing here. I'm a graduate of his program. I, I walked into the emergency room with chest pain, and within 30 minutes, he was putting a stent in me. So he, he, he really does work. Um, <laughs> So we have some difficulties in long-term care. Uh, it's really where the rubber meets the road in society. We have poor people who need care. Where does a homeless person who is admitted to Stanford, septic and sick, they recover and they still need ongoing therapy? Where do they go? They go to Seton Coastside. Where does an overdose go who has suffered a seizure and has brain damage and is on a trait and a ventilator, where do they go? They go to our subacute. Where does a person with Lou Gehrig's disease who has opted to be ventilator dependent has a tracheostomy and they're poor, where do they go for lifetime of care? They go to Seton subacute. So we really do take care of the poor people and I'm proud to be part of that team. We have wonderful nursing staff, wonderful therapists who are committed to taking care of these patients and they are difficult to take care of most of the time. So I hope that we don't end up with a closure but if we do they're going to be facing some very difficult problems. The subacute patients and there's 44 of them are 100 percent Medi-Cal on, on the Medi-Cal subacute program. When St. Luke's subacute closed, uh, when CPMC bought St. Luke's and closed the, the uh, subacute, they thought they could easily move those patients to their hospitals, ventilator dependent, in San Francisco. No way. First of all, they're not patients when they're in post-acute care, they're residents. And residents have rights. And one of their rights is to say, yes, I will go, and no, I won't go. And, and it was a powerful meeting that I went to in San Francisco with the San, San Francisco Health Commission when some of these patients were being discussed and how to deal with them. So it's very, very difficult. I would imagine this will take not months, but years to, uh, to uh, solve the subacute program, notwithstanding the possibility of a, of a structure uh, being built or modified to handle them outside of the system. The same is true with our patient population at Coastside. Uh, that, wh where, do you, where do you put a homeless patient? Where do you put patients who have no family? Um, it's, it's unbelievable. And to give you an idea how hard it is to place these patients, many of them are custodial care. But what, when, when we had one patient, she was perfect normal, talking, walking, didn't really meet any skilled nursing facility criteria, but we couldn't discharge her. She had no place to go. Health plan of San Mateo. Sorry, Doctor, Andrew. to cut you off, but I forgot to turn the timer off, but oh, no. two no, minutes I'm have passed. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Speakers next is Mark Zichowski. Yes, yes. Followed by Peggy Chu Wong. If you're the, if you're the next speaker, could you come up and oh, line up over here? Turn it on. Thank you, supervisors, for this opportunity. Um, I've been at Seton for 30 years as a staff member. And uh, during that time, I had the privilege of also being uh, chairman of medicine for three terms. And so I oversee a lot of medical doctors, and one group that I see is infectious disease. And we talked about the pandemic to, uh, today many times, and this is what I'm concerned about. We have a pandemic. It's coming. We know that. And for us to consider closing a hospital that has 14 beds that can take ventilators that are critical and the thing that we hear most about the, north, uh, the uh, coronavirus. So why would we do that? This is, this is irresponsible. Second irresponsibility, I blame on Verity. Verity has done nothing to prepare us for this 
pandemic coming. All the other hospitals in the county have done so. And to clarify a little bit, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Baranoff, just to correct you, you already had your chance to bid, yeah. and we're not ready to delay it even more again. We yes. need to make an action now. We need to save Seaton now, and we have a viable a bidder, and we just need to make it happen. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thomas Norris, then Coleman, Ryan, and then Warren Chang. Peggy Chin Wong. Okay, next speaker, Thomas no Novis. Okay. And if we could have um, the next speakers line up Peggy Chin Wong, then Thomas Novis, Coleman, Ryan, and then Warren Chang. So Peggy, it's okay, but could the speakers that are called line up here so we could move this through a little faster, please? Thank you. So thank you um, to the Board of Supervisors for listening to our concerns tonight. Um, I'd like to speak briefly on three areas that are important to me. First, I represent um, pharmacy. I've been a pharmacist at Seton for 20 years, 12 at Seton, 8 at Coastside. I serve Coastside, 9th floor, and 4th floor as Dr. Hazel Hurst so eloquently mentioned. For me, long-term care is very important. Those beds are necessary for our community. In this county, we have an aging community, a homeless community, and those beds are necessary for their care. They would not receive care otherwise. And I see the staff every day taking care of them to the best that we can with what little resources we have. Secondly, the coronavirus is coming. And as Dr. Tucciosi mentioned, it's irresponsible to have 10 floors of beds that we could use with negative pressure rooms to contain the virus and keep our community safe. Those are two very important areas to me. Lastly is a personal thing. I'm also a patient. In 2018, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I received surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation treated by Dr. Pamela Lewis. Dr. Barry Chowser, Dr. Ken Yamamoto, and the nurses at the Infusion Center, which is now closed. If that hospital was not here to treat me, I would not be here. I would not have chosen to go anywhere else except for Seton. Lastly, I would like to ask Verity, is this how you would treat your family? Would you treat your family member this way? I'd also like to ask if there's a representative from the Attorney General's office to investigate that Verity for unfair business business practices. My husband is an attorney, so he asked he wanted me to ask that tonight if the Attorney General is here or representative to delay the bankruptcy and investigate Verity. Thank you. Thomas Norris. Followed by Coleman Ryan, then Warren Chang, and then Robert Perez. The members of the board, uh, my name is Thomas Norris. Uh, I'm chairman of the board of directors of Seton Medical Center. And I speak today on behalf of the board. Now, just so everybody knows, the board of directors of Seton Medical Center is the community board that's made up of members of our community that live here, that oversee the day-to-day -day operation of the hospital. Verity is the corporate entity that owns it all, and there's a Verity board that makes all the decisions that are going on right now. So our board does not have any authority over anything as far as that goes. Our job is just to see that the community is being served and that the hospital is doing a good job. Now, I've been chairman of the board since 2015, and this hospital has improved every year. We've been in bankruptcy now for 18 months, and we went from a two-star hospital to a four-star hospital. We were rated as a D hospital on LeapFrog, and we are an A hospital in bankruptcy. That's right! That's because of all the people that work hard here and that believe in this hospital. Now, this hospital belongs to the community. Verity has done what they can do, and you know, we talk about what's going on with sales. All these things are done with non-disclosures, and so everybody's side of the argument cannot be heard. But you have buyers and you have sellers, 
and buyers want to buy cheap and sellers want to buy high. So let's just be reasonable about this. We are where we are right now. There's a bankruptcy court that is overseeing all of this. So there's rules that have to be followed. We don't have the, the discretion to just say that we can just go right around the bankruptcy court. We gotta deal within the rules of bankruptcy. So what happened in the past is the past. Now, our community has to come together right now and we need to come together. I'm going to. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not sitting down yet. Our community needs to get together, and all of the leaders of our community have to get together. Our cities, our state, and our county. Because we are now responsible for what happens here. I've been an elected public official in the north end of the county here for 35 out of the last 40 years. So I know what it's like to sit up there and to have responsibility for people that elect you. Now we have a virus that's coming on. We have to deal with it. If everyone else is gone, our county has to deal with it. So we have to make some tough decisions. The board, the state, the cities, everyone has to come together now and figure out how we do it. But it's not gonna be easy and it's not gonna take a lot of time because bankruptcy is not gonna wait forever. So if we're going to do something, we need to step up now, and we need to let the bankruptcy know that we're serious, we're going to do something, because they will cut off the funds, they will end it for us, and we can't let that happen. So I'm challenging all of us that are in public service right now, all of us who are in the private sector, businesses, other hospitals that will have to pick up the slack, they got to get involved too, because it affects everybody. So I'm hoping that we will really get the message today about forgetting what happened in the past, what happens today, and what happens in the future is what's important. And that's what we need to focus on. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. President, we have 23 more speakers. Next is Coleman Ryan, followed by Warren Chang, then Robert Perez, and then Stephen Girard. Good evening, and thank you very much for taking the time to listen to us. And, uh, my name is Coleman Ryan. I've been a member of the, the staff at Seton Medical Center for 43 years, wow. since I was five. Yeah. I'm a chief of cardiology. I'm a retired cardiologist, and I'm also vice chairman of the board, and I've been on the board of Seton for 30 years. But I'm here to represent myself. Uh, we had two very important anniversaries this uh, just last week. Uh, one is the walkabout talk about in uh, Saramonte, where we actually educate the public on prevention and I was a very big part of starting that and, and maintaining it that, and my, my work, my research work was all on the Asian population here and I published numerous papers about uh, uh, prevention of cardiac disease. The next, uh, next one was the San Francisco Heart Institute is 40 years old yesterday so and I was one of the founders of the San Francisco <laughs> We, I'm also involved in the STEMI program and also the stroke. And I do want to mention the stroke program. But the other thing that's important is, is that I also was a patient there. I, had, I also had cancer. And Barry Chaucer, who's here, and probably going to speak, who's responsible for uh, curing me with the, his radiation therapy. I'm five years out of a major uh, leg uh, cancer. And uh, no sign of it coming back, thank God. And the third thing is, uh, recently I had what I thought was appendicitis. And I got my wife, I live right beside Peninsula Hospital, the Taj Mahal. And I was having extreme pain. And I said to my wife, it's not, not easy or not hard to tell her to go fast, because she goes faster all the time. But I said, get me to see. So I, we went through the traffic. I put up with the pain for the, the extra 25 minutes. Because I am also in charge of quality. Uh, for the hospital. That's my determination is I'm a medical director of quality and I knew that's what I would get and I got it. Thank you. Followed by Robert Perez and then Stephen Girard and then Mike Schumacher. Good evening. Uh, my name is Warren Chang. I'm a physician on staff at Seton. I think I've met all of you uh, in prior meetings. Um, I'm also uh, a member of the Seton Board of Directors. Um, everything I was going to say was just said by our illustrious chairman, uh, Mr. Tom Nurris, but he said it much better than I would have said it. But um, 
What I would uh, emphasize, though, is that I think part of the tragedy here is that we see that we have a seller and we, ha we obviously have buyers. Um, and people in this room are wondering, well, why can't we somehow come to an agreement here? And I'm not at liberty to be able to discuss what, was, what we talked about, but suffice to say that there are significant gaps. Um, and um, this is where we need help, okay? Um, and what I mean by help is we need some heavy lifting from the people who are sitting in front of me, the county, okay? Um, we've gone past the point where study sessions are going to help us here. We really need concrete help to really help bridge the gap between the buyer and the seller. It's possible, okay? We have time. It's not a lot of time, but we have time. So what I'm saying is that, to those people seated in front of me, is that there are, are very concrete things that the county can help us with. We'd be more than happy to share those with you uh, if you are interested. Uh, I think everybody in this room wants to keep seating open, uh, including the buyers here too. So we can bridge this gap, but we really do need your help. Seaton's always been there for the county. Now we need the county. Mike Schumacher and then Ron Appel. Uh, talk, I talk about later. Supervisors, I apologize for turning around and addressing the audience, but I think the audience uh, knows that I can speak very loudly, just like Donald Trump. And <laughs> that's the only uh, similarity I have with him. Um, I have a lot of dissimilarities. Uh, this pin that was put on me was placed on me by Joe Biden about nine years ago when my brother was made the civil rights, uh, the, the, the attorney general assistant and to civil rights. So um, the point being is that, um, you know, we are in a very serious situation here. Um, we're trying to avoid, you know, litigation. That, that never results in a quick response. Uh, but what will re result in a quick response is getting people in the room in an amicable environment. We're really lucky that, uh, you know, we have two of the main players involved in this amalgamation uh, of the South and the buy. So the point is, is that um, we have Sam Mizell here who, you know, graciously accepted my offer and I promised him that I would take any bullets for him at this point because we need him to understand how to deal with this complicated sale. Because as many people said, this problem didn't occur two years ago with Verity. It's, it started 15 years ago in a very bad way with uh, the, the nuns mismanaging the hospital. So um, to his credit, he has come here, and now we have a buyer that's here. We've gotten them together. We started today in negotiating. We're, we're, as I told you four weeks ago when I was here, we're going to finish this sale. And this is going to be a very concrete situation. It's very obvious this hospital cannot be closed. Right. Um, the, yes. yeah. These outline set, uh, all these options, but quite frankly, they're not realistic. You know, for instance, we had our IV infusion center closed, and uh, the ombudsman uh, uh, reported to the bankruptcy court that this would be a soft landing for these people with, IV, with cancer getting IV therapy. That soft landing never happened. We received multiple nasty letters from area hospitals saying, next time you send us a tsunami of patients, please you have the decency to let us know because we can't service most of them. Some of them are going to get hurt. So th this is, there's too many corollaries with this that tell us that we cannot let this hospital close. It's not we, it, it won't. The bankruptcy judge is also very intuitive and has had this situation before. So, um, what I'm trying to reassure you is that we are making a lot of good progress with the transfer and sale. Uh, we have, we, there's no option to close. We're looking forward. And what, what, what Warren Shank talked about, help, you know, we're going we, to need a lot of help afterwards from Maya Altman. Their health plan group really uses more than 8%. I, I'm a frontline provider at all three of these hospitals she talked about, and Seton by far you know, quadruples the amount of care that these, these other hospitals have. 
Seton has all Ex the primary care. Excuse me, you need to wrap it up, sir. Okay, all right. Anyway, the point being is that um, that's what I have with Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that we are going to make this happen. I promise you that this Seton is not going to close. Hi there, I'm Dr. Steven Girard. I'm the medical director for the nuclear medicine department of the clinical laboratory at Seton. I've been there about 18 years serving the patients we serve. Thank you for giving me the opportunity and giving all of us the opportunity to share our feedback with you. The one concern I would like to share with you is the one echoing what Dr. Warren Chang just shared with you, namely how the county is in a position to step up and give us some essential help uh, which may be needed. Uh, I agree with what some others have said that it doesn't help us get to where we need to go to languish in problems that we've had in the recent past, but to where we need to get to. And it, it seems to me that we have a bit of a gap at the moment of something on the order of 10 to 20, maybe a little more, a million dollars between what the offers are prepared to pay and, and uh, what Verity is prepared to accept. I recall that um, uh, back in 2012, 2013, Seton materially participated in assisting for the campaigning of the Measure A funds which passed and now provides, according to the county website, something on the order of 70 to 80 million dollars a year uh, to the county for uh, the, the receipts from that sales tax. I do appreciate that the county has made some contribution from those funds, but at the moment we have a critical need, a critical need to bridge that gap and the need is dire for the near future, the, the state of of uh, panic in the hospital and concern by the employees is making it very difficult to maintain operations. I invite the county supervisors to look for that assistance to help us get to where we need to go to make this deal happen as soon as possible. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm neither a buyer nor a seller. So what I am though is a, a parent resident at Seton Coast site and uh, what I can tell you is that place is a small gold nugget. Dr. H is, is there all the time, he knows, and he was talking about... Sir, you, oh. if you could direct your comments to the board, please. Thank you. Sorry about that. People who are on Medi-Cal, I mean, that's a sad place to walk the halls because those people have zip, nothing. And on Medi-Cal, at that location, they're getting great health care. My son has had six and a half years of it. The staff is incredible. So the thought of it closing, to me, is inconceivable. One other comment. You mentioned it's difficult to find sniff vents. It's not difficult. It's impossible. My wife and I spent 30 days every day we went to 28 different skilled nursing facilities starting in San Francisco, ending in San Jose. We graded them from A through F. We had 11 Fs. A lot of those places I wouldn't put an animal into, right? So they're just, they say, look, you ask them the question, do you have Medi-Cal beds? Well, of course we do. By law, they have to say that. The fact of the matter is, they don't take any in. Because we went back time after time after time, and they said, yeah, well, we're going to have one uh, next week. Come back next week. Okay. No, well, it's changed. Well, we cracked the code. They don't accept Medi-Cal patients. They say they will, but they don't. Why? Because they lose money. So keep these hospitals open, please. The team is great. Thanks. Thank you. Josiah, Dr. Josiah Chilau, child. child. Okay, I guess you can come up first, Doctor. Dr. Josiah Chilau, and then Christine Feller, followed by Christian Ingers Mahler. I'm Dr. Josiah Child. I'm uh, run the emergency department at Seton, and uh, I've been there now for two years. And I would have to say that in the two years we've recruited basically a new staff there in the department. Uh, in the face of bankruptcy and all the tumultuous times. And the community has been 
what's allowed us to recruit doctors in. They love working in this community. We've got physicians from some of the best training programs in the entire country working here. They're fabulous. And they feel very passionately about continuing to work in this community. I would say, the one point I would say to uh, Ms. Altman is that we know that Seton you know, is able to deliver their services on extremely low budgets and charge the county you know, wonderful rates. And we are concerned, obviously, that if Seton is not there, that Kaiser will not be as friendly to you uh, as uh, we think we are. So uh, I hope you'll give us as deepest consideration as possible. Thank you. Christine Fuller, followed by Kipstrin Ingers Mahler, and then Cotton Woodlecombe, and then Bessie Garcia. Good evening, Honorable Board of Supervisors and the Council um, staff, and to everybody that is present. Um, I am Christine Fuller. I was born and raised in the city of Daly City, um, St. Mary's Health Hospital, and I'm a former employee of the emergency department. Um, Dr. Childs and I kind of just met, but um, I'm also an EMT. Um, to say that if the hospital closes and to put it in AMR's hands, all I think about is patients dying and litigation occurring. That should never be on our fire department. That should never be on a paramedic or an EMT. As a matter of fact, this is not even a county problem or a state problem. This is a verity problem between bankruptcy courts. I had questions on the uh, prior study session where verity wasn't even present. I asked about the cured cost of all the amounts pursuant to the section codes 363 and 365 of the bankruptcy court and why they keep denying the purchase agreements for the APA asset purchase agreement. The reason why I ask is because I'm also a realtor. So I don't understand. The Attorney General guidelines are crystal clear. Why do they keep denying the offers? It is not transparent and it is not fair for any patient or worker or you know, just in general on a sense. I did ask what other county measures can be implemented um, about Prop 52 or Senate Bill 608. Uh, Supervisor Canapa, I commend you for your efforts, Ann Keegrin, Tony, your entire staff, Bill Silverfard, they've been phenomenal in getting back to me with answers, but there's still um, a lot of answers that have not been answered. Um, is there a court of appeals process or has this been directed to the Ninth Circuit Court? Um, you attacked my supervisor by saying he put you on the spot, sir, I'm sorry, but you put yourself on the spot, and if you stand up and look at all these people, think about what you guys are doing. Accept a damn offer. Cotton will come, and then Betsy Garcia. Mr. President, we have 15 speakers. I'm Kirsten Ergensmaller. I'm with the Ombudsman Services of San Mateo County, not the bankruptcy ombudsman person, so don't hiss at me. But um, I make a regular visits to the skilled nursing facilities on the 4th and 9th floor in Daly City and out to Coastside and want to reiterate what everyone has said here that this is a population that is going to be extremely hard to place. Um, I think that I, I really appreciate the report that Louise and Maya gave uh, I, I, and, and want to encourage you to insist that the reasonable transition happens. I think that's going to be very expensive for them because it is so hard to find um, long-term custodial beds. And these are people, like when I go to the fourth floor, I visit moms who have sat by the bedsides of their children for through all of the transitions for eight years. They come there on Samtrans. They don't have any money. How are they gonna visit this person who cannot speak for themselves, who's on a ventilator, on a feeding tube, and may end up in another county far, far away? It's the same with the coast, coast side sniff patients, is that they're all pretty much Medi-Cal patients, and they, we, it takes 18 months for us to find another placement for them to transition into assisted living. If they have to go to long-term custodial, 
that's going to take even longer. So if you're going to insist on a reasonable transition, they need to factor that into their cost in the bankruptcy proceedings. Thank you. Cotton will come. Okay. Betsy Garcia, followed by John Avalos, and then Clear 210, and then Jill Manzano. Good evening, Supervisor. My name is Betsy Garcia, and I work as a charge nurse at Seattle Medical Center, and I dedicated my 27 years of service, my life and career to Seattle Coastside and its patient and community. I just want to let uh, Verity know that uh, Ever since they uh, acquired the Seaton Coast site and Seaton Daily City, they promised the Attorney General that they will keep Daily City and Seaton Coast site open. But for, for the first year and second year, and we have here facing bankruptcy already, they did not fulfill their promise for, from the Attorney General. And my mother also was a patient last year at Seaton Coast site. And she died last year with, uh, with dignity because of the nurses there and the help of Dr. Hazelhurst and the community. So, uh, and Seaton Coast Side is the only uh, lifeline medical service between Santa Cruz County and San Mateo and uh, San Francisco County. And most of our patients coming from uh, San Francisco, UCSF, Stanford. And most of them also has medical and homeless patients. And our patient's acuity is very high. We have a patient that has psychotic problems, behavioral problems, and they're hard to place them in other places. So they send them to us. So I'm asking the San Mateo County, the re one of the richest uh, county in the city, <laughs> to please uh, keep San Seaton Coast site open and Seaton Daily City. We need them. <laughs> and then Joe Manzano, and then Kalima Salahuddin. Good evening, supervisors. My name is John Avalos, and I'm a union rep with the National Union of Healthcare Workers, and I am proud to be here to represent not just NUHW members, but all the workers of Seton Medical Center who have been working with great great anxiety about what's going to happen to our facility. And despite the, the unknown future of this hospital, they've been working day in and day out giving the highest level of patient care. You've heard that the ratings have actually gone up over the past year because that's their dedication. They have not received that same kind of care and concern from Verity uh, and also the main bidder of, uh, who was actually looking to still pick up the remains of Seat Medical Center, uh, SGM KPC. I'm really concerned that we don't have a real process. Dr. Perez, to his credit, is giving us hope, but we actually have heard that closure is imminent like next week. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that was in the paper, and it seems like if it's in the paper, it's really hard to dispute that that's, we could have a shutdown next week for the center. We have to have a parallel process. We have to look at uh, continuing with the bankruptcy court and the private sector to do a bid process and do a transaction that may or may not happen. I don't have a lot of hope in that because we had 18 months for that to happen, and it hasn't happened yet. So. I call upon the other part of the parallel process is the county to step up and look at what resources you have available to make sure that we can keep this hospital facility open as we're seeing the outbreak of the coronavirus and other potential pandemics bear down on us in the 21st century. This is an essential medical facility that serves a vital part of the community. There are a number of issues to look at. What are your finances that are available to actually purchase the hospital, just do the retrofit of the hospital, lease the hospital to an operator to do it while you have it in your ownership, look at the other uses of the land that could be a mix of hospital uses that could have other economic development. I have not seen the county do anything like that, and now we're at uh, the 11th hour. 
I appreciate there are three members of the Board of Supervisors who are here right now. There are actually five members. If, I, if, if there are two members who are not here, I sure hope their staff are here because all of you represent the entire county of San Mateo, not just your own little districts, but the entire county. And you have to work together to make sure that we don't have a health desert in this part of the county that affects low-income immigrants, Filipino, Latino, elderly people in this part of the, of the county. It's up to you to work together. We are here at your disposal to help in this process. You have all these resources to make happen, and you have financing available that you can actually seek to look at capital improvements up to purchasing the hospital. We are here to help you with that political heavy lift. Thank, Thank you. you. Claire Tutat. I'm a psychiatrist employed at the Sevitalo Medical Center and I can attest to the difficulty in placing people, especially with psychiatric problems and Medi-Cal, in uh, long-term care facilities and Seeking Coastside is a priceless gem. But I'm really here because I'm a member of the Mid-Coast Community Council which uh, represents to the communities between Pacifica and Half Moon Bay along the Highway 1 corridor to the Board of Supervisors. We have twice taken positions on the closure or um, changes even to uh, Seaton Coast side in particular. Uh, beyond the, the value as a uh, sniff, uh, Seaton Coast side is really the only medical facility that's available to the people between, as somebody said, Daly City and Santa Cruz. Uh, you provide the only x-ray department, the only lab services, uh, one of the very few uh, physical therapy facilities, um, the only urgent care facility anywhere in that entire stretch of road. Uh, we are an isolated community. It's very hard for us to get out of the community because of all the tourist traffic that, that keeps us right where we are. If if there's a, a, somebody has a heart attack on a Saturday afternoon, they're not going anywhere. Um, they, they, if Seaton Coast Site isn't there, they're, they're going to get no services whatsoever. So it's a point that I wanted to emphasize that beyond everything that everybody's mentioned, the community of the Mid-Coast depends on medical care from Seaton Coast Site. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Mr. President, we have 10 more speakers. Joe Manzano, followed by Kalima Salahuddin, Brian Grady, and then Dr. Barry Chaucer. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Joe Manzano. I'm a radiographer at uh, Seton Medical Center. In there 20 years. Um, it's apparent from what Dr. Uh, Milhouse, Dr. Coleman Ryan, and others have said that uh, this hospital is, is is the foundation of our community. That being said, closure is not an option. It really is not an option. Uh, I believe you said, uh, um, Ms. Rogers, you said that uh, San Mateo has had a $59 million budget deficit for healthcare, is that correct? 57, 57. And Seton Medical Center has had a $60 million budget deficit. Well, if Seton closes, and most of these patients are Medi-Cal, Medicare, what is the county going to do to absorb these patients? What plan does the county have in terms of being able to support these patients that now will flood the system itself? That being said, those who are now going into the system, my question is, what access will be provided for these patients once these patients are no longer uh, having uh, health care available to them uh, at Seton Medical Center. And lastly, I think the county uh, should consider uh, financial um, support uh, in lieu of this, pop this possible crisis for the county itself in terms of 
its financial commitment to the communities. Uh, that being said, as well, I had a question. Uh, what is it that the county, that the supervisors here have for supporting, um, what is it, for supporting um, the community in saying that this will stay as a, a coded operation for hospital operations only? The, the, the effects, the, let me just finish. The effects are obviously very clear in terms of the cost it will cost Daly City if Seton closes. And so the pressure is very clear that uh, politically and financially that if Seton closes, what will happen to Daly City? So it's be very clear that we need direction from the county as well as from Seton and the buyers to um, come together and give us uh, some direction as to uh, what we can do. Thank, Thank you for you. your Thank time. You. Kareem Asala Houdin, followed by Brian Grady, Barry Chaucer, and then Brianna Evans. Hi, my name is Kareem Asala Houdin. I'm the president of the Jefferson Union High School District Board. I'm here, uh, there's a number of school board members here. Um, and when you think about uh, a measure of community, and for me, a community is and how you measure it is how we treat the least resourced of us. And as a school board member, I don't really see having a functional community and school district in an area that doesn't have a working and viable health care system, and especially emergency room services. Um, the other uh, thing that I want to speak about, other people who are more qualified can speak to the medical services they provide, but it is a community hospital. A number of our students intern there, volunteer there and have decided to become medical professionals with the time they spent there. Our adult special education program, that is where they get their workforce experience. My son was one of those people that was his first job working in the gift shop. He was one of the smiling faces you saw when you walked in. And he now has a job and he learned those services at this hospital. Personally, uh, my son has autism and he also has epilepsy. While he was riding the bus in his teen years, he had four grand mal seizures. The bus driver found him. We have Kaiser. They took him to Seton. I went to Kaiser when I heard he was in the emergency room and they said, no, he's at Seton. I was wondering why would they take him there? That isn't our medical provider. And I was told that Kaiser refused to take him. So he's here, he's 23 years old, he's a thriving adult. But I wonder what would happen if he had a seizure and the hospital wasn't here to service him and our own medical provider refused those services. So I thank you for taking the time to meet with us here. I'm hoping that we can all figure a way to really make sure that this community stays a true community and serves our least resource folks. Chaucer, Brianna Evans, and then Rosie Tejada. Hi, my name is Dr. Brian Grady. Um, I'm a urologist. I'm the chief elect of the medical staff at Seton Hospital. I'm also the current president of the San Francisco Marin Medical Society. And um, when I heard about the study group, um, I had a different idea of what this meeting was going to be about. Rather than hear about the impact it would have if this hospital was to close, I thought it was going to be a meeting about ideas to save the hospital. So I'd like to thank some of the previous speakers, like John Avalos, for thinking about these kinds of things. Um, to say that Seton only has 13% market share in the county um, does not tell the story at all. Um, I don't have to tell the county supervisors how large the county is geographically, how diverse it is, and you cannot make blanket statements using statistics like that. If I had chest pain right now and there was no hospital here, it would be at least 30 minutes. And in traffic, it could take 60 minutes to get to the nearest hospital. What chance would I have? Um, and I understand very well that the transfer of a hospital from a private entity to a private entity is something that I, as a physician, all the physicians here, the nurses, we don't have a seat at that table. But the people who could have a seat at the table are our elected, elected officials. Maybe not the county level, but perhaps definitely the attorney general. And so one of the best pieces of advice, is, advice I ever had from a teacher in medical school was 
be prepared and show up with a head full of ideas. So what I'm asking is that if we convene future meetings, that we try to think creatively about how to save this hospital, mixed land use, um, recruiting business partners who might be interested in having their own health care done here, some of the large employers in the south part of the county. So thanks for your time. Thank you. Mr. President, we have seven more speakers, Dr. Barry Chaucer, then Brianna Evans, and then Rosie Tejada. I'm Dr. Barry Chaucer, I'm Director of Radiation Oncology. I'm here also with my associate, Dr. Mei Wen Wu, and our medical oncologist, Dr. Bob Weber, was here, and he has a lot of children. I think he probably went home to babysit. But um, quick comment, I understand we have the seller here, and there was a buyer. Thank you. There's the family, there's the jail across the way. Can we put them both in a cell and not let them out till they reach a deal? <laughs> You've been hearing uh, a lot about why it's important to have an acute care unit. Uh, if you don't get the stroke taken care of right away or the heart taken right away, you're gonna have a lot of morbidity and mortality. You've heard the other end where we have people who can't take care of themselves and need care. What I want to address is oncology services, which is somewhere in between. Uh, as you know, all of us have been touched with cancer, either yourself, your friend, a relative, co-worker. You know that uh, oncology is a multimodality treatment program that after surgery requires radiation therapy often, as well as chemotherapy. And the radiation therapy portion requires multiple visits daily, Monday through Friday, for anywhere from three to seven weeks. Same thing for chemotherapy, multiple infusions. These patients are sometimes wrapped with pain due to the bone metastases, that are wrapped with the uh, side effects of the treatment. Where do we get our patients from? Looking at statistics from the American College of Surgeons and the cancer program, by the way, we're a, a fully accredited American College Commission on Cancer program, which I think is a feather in our hat because we have to go through a lot of hoops in order to obtain that. Turns out that Almost 90% of our patients come within nine miles of the hospital. Can you imagine patients having to go to the nearest facility, next nearest facility, if there's no seat? In? It's between 15 to 30 miles. A single round trip, sure, if you need a doctor's visit, is not bad. But having to do this daily, for five to seven weeks, I think, is an added burden for people who are already devastated by a terrible disease. So I ask Verity and the council to take all of this into account as we try to negotiate a deal to keep the hospital. Thank you. Brianna Evans, followed by Rosie Tejada, and then Councilmember Pamela Di Giovanni and then Councilmember Justin Manalo. Thank you, Supervisor Canaba, uh, Chief uh, Rogers, and Director Altman for your compassionate words and your uh, reasoned thoughts at the beginning of the night tonight. I also appreciate Supervisor Pine and Supervisor Slocum for your presence and engagement tonight. Many have spoken already on the potential risks to patients and possible gaps in transition plans, but since I haven't heard a lot about it tonight, I wanted to underscore something that's obvious to most of us, that unemployment is also a public health risk. We know from the NIH for over 30 years, they've very plainly recognized that unemployment leads to increased anxiety, depression, and substance use for many people. There's a financial risk to families and financial stress can cause long-term issues for children and families that are difficult for us to quantify sometimes, but we see them. Looking around the room, I wonder which communities and which families in particular will be most impacted by the loss of good jobs at Seton. What are the demographics of Seton employees? Which groups are disproportionately impacted? As a county, we always intend to support all communities fairly. We can only do that if we take a clear-headed look at the data on who is impacted by our decisions. 
I appreciate the energy and the effort that's going into saving this hospital, to keeping it open. As a member of this community, I only have one ask in the process, which is to consider an equity lens as you take steps in support of Seton, its patients, its employees, and its broader community of families and neighbors. Mr. President, we have five more speakers. Rosie Tejada, followed by Councilmember Pamela DiGiovanni, and then Councilmember Justin Manalo. Good evening, Supervisors. I'm Rosie Tejada. I'm the Vice President of the Jefferson Union High School District Board of Trustees. I also grew up in Daly City, and uh, I live in Pacifica. I've raised my children in Daly City. Um, when, every year when you fill out the forms for school, they ask you what hospital do you want your child to be taken to in case of an emergency, and every year it is Seton Medical Center. Now, what do I fill in if this happens? This cannot happen. I, this, this month, I celebrate 10 years of being cancer free, and that has a large um, Seton Medical Center and all of its staff has a lot to do with that because I was treated for breast cancer at Seton. The level of care I had was amazing. It was a very difficult time. I had two young children, I was a single mom, and I was caring for two elderly parents. Seton kept me alive. It saved me. So we, there are lives at stake. That's all I can say. I mean, we cannot close. It is the largest, we are the largest city in the county to not have a hospital? Ridiculous. So I have faith that you'll find a way to keep Seton open. Thank you. Before I call on Council Member Giovanni, I do want to call Mr. Sam Mazel. Um, he does have a speaker card, so if you want. I uh, am surprised that, uh, you know, first I'd like to say that there, there is no one who disputes that this hospital provides great care, that the staff is wonderful and have exerted themselves remarkably in difficult situation for a long time. The issue is how do we fund it? How do we pay for it going forward? And the speakers who urge you to come up with some innovative ideas I share their hope that you'll do so because Verity is a not-for-profit system. It will cease to exist when this bankruptcy case is over. It isn't a large hospital chain. It has three hospitals operating left, one of which makes money and supports all the other hospitals in the system. So if you have imaginative ideas, now's the time. And, and it shouldn't come as a surprise. These hospitals have been widely known to be financially distressed, one of the speakers before said it, for a decade. The Daughters of Charity struggled and eventually abandoned them. Yes, very smart investors from New York tried to turn them around and could not, in part because of the conditions imposed by the Attorney General. Patrick Soon Chung came in here and he tried and he couldn't turn it around either. We are left, and he's out. He, he is, he's had nothing to do with the case except to be just one of a thousand creditors since we filed bankruptcy. One of the first things we did as Council of Verity when we filed was to terminate the management relationship with the system. So if you have imaginative ideas to keep these hospitals open, Now's the time. Um, can, can I respond to that? Thank you. Why should I respond to that? So, we, as you heard, we are negotiating. We have been negotiating. We struggled for 18 months. Before that, the daughters employed Hulahan Loki for over a year. They could not find a buyer for the system. We've employed Kane Brothers. These are internationally known investment bankers to try to find buyers. We found one buyer for the system. 
that was SGM, and in December they refused to close. And when we met here and with the Attorney General's representative, we warned that if the SGM transaction didn't close, this hospital was at risk. It can't come as a surprise that it's at risk now, because in December, everyone, there was concerns about our lack of transparency. We're in bankruptcy. Everything we do is subject to court approval. We have filed papers. We have, this is the most public transaction for the sale of a hospital, because it is in bankruptcy. Everything we do is scrutinized by unsecured creditors who are owed a half a billion dollars. So, uh, secured creditors who are owed a half a billion dollars, unsecured creditors who are probably owned twice, the, twice as much, a patient care ombudsman, the United States trustee's office, and a federal judge. So it, it isn't that we're not transparent. What has happened here has been completely transparent. We have now tried, since SGM refused to close, to find a buyer. We're still talking to people. If you have ideas to help us, we're open. You know, let, let me just make a couple comments. You know, um, Sam, there's a heart in there. There's a heart. I, I can tell you care. I do care. And I think the way you can demonstrate how you care, um, we always have to look in the mirror at the end of the day. You know, I make decisions. you got to look in the mirror. And so I think the thing that I would encourage you to do, um, and you have to act really fast because you guys may be closing on us, is really look in the mirror and figure out how you're going to sell this to a hospital buyer. You, but that's, that's what you have to do. For you to sort of kind of say you have no control and you know, all these things are sort of at play, you're in a leadership position. You're the council. You're in a leadership, you're in a leadership position. You're the council. And I think the right thing to do for this community, and I think for yourself, because I can tell it's, it's tough on you, is to really make sure that this is sold to a hospital buyer. Okay? Yes. I spent 20 years in the service of this nation, 15 years in uniform, five years overseas, a year in a war zone. Mm -hmm. I do believe in public service. I do believe in serving the communities of the United States. Mm -hmm. I have done that. But I also have to operate within the framework of federal law. Mm -hmm. And my clients' options here are not unlimited. My options are not unlimited. I can't rewrite federal law to do the right thing if federal law doesn't allow it. You'll figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. President, we have three speakers. Council Member Pamela Giovanni, Council Member Justin Manalo, and then Dr. Edgardo Alikawe. Thank you, Board of Supervisors, for being here tonight. I really appreciate it because you know that that we are one community together in whatever issues we face, whether it's sea level rise or whatever we do, and we have a pandemic coming, and we know that we want everyone's lives to be saved. So it's unacceptable that he stands here today when I heard him at Coma Community Center, and he comes there today. The reason he's in a federal position and can't say anything is because he got, they got themselves there to begin with without being transparent and not helping us to begin with. We have a buyer here, and the doctors have even flown down and talked with the Apollo group, and Dr. Perez has all the information, and then, and then why does he accept it? Well, we know that the Attorney General said, okay, we give you six years, okay? So we got six years. So what is their plan after six years, I would ask you? Are they going to try to sell it on who they want to sell it to? And then they try to do like an entitlement and then, and then try to make it sure like a development? Because they can lawyer up and after the six years and they try to do that to us. But I ask you, because I know you can do it, is that we come together and I know give us, that I know we have, we have to take action. We cannot like, this is great that you're here and the other two were not able to make it, but take it back to your colleagues and say, we have, what can the county do to help us now? Because these people's lives are in line, they're under a lot of stress, our nurses, our healthcare workers, our physicians, our community, all of us together are my colleagues because it's weighing on us and I know it weighs on you because I know I know you guys personally and very humble. So I ask you not to believe, which I know you're very smart, all of you, not to believe everything that is saying on what who they want as a buyer. Because you already know actions speak louder than words. And those actions to me are appalling and um and and, and saying to them 
that they don't care. They don't care. They really don't care about our community. But I know you do, and you'll help us in whatever way you can, in your reserves or whatever you can, uh, with your other colleagues. So please, we have to come together now because we're all community together, and they deserve it. We deserve it. Our lives depend on it. And Engine 92, before I stop, is, sir, is the most used engine in the county and has the most, um, how many runs? A day, the most, and that's at the top of the hill. So we have daytime population at Ceremony Mall, and if we have an active shooter or anything else, where are they going to go? Our daytime population is from everywhere. Thank you very much. Council Member Justin Manalo, followed by Dr. Edgardo Alikoi, and then Hala Hijazi. Good evening. Good evening, Supervisors. Thank you for meeting here in Daly City today. Um, uh, I'm Vice Mayor for the City of Daly City, and we know how important Seton Medical Center is for our community, as it is the safety net for the most vulnerable. As mentioned today, there's major skilled nursing facilities for the elderly. It operates as an ER room. And what we need is verity to have a conscience and to realize that lives will be lost if you don't sell a hospital, sell, sell it to a buyer that's a hospital. Have it on your conscience that as mentioned today in the audience, as medical workers, we heard how lives were just saved the other day. Have it on your conscience to ensure that it's sold to a hospital. We have the commitment here from the city of Daly City, as the mayor mentioned, that we will remain the land used to be hospital, but we, we are also looking at how do we sustain the hospital. Supervisors, thank you for this time to listen. Seated may be in Daly City, but you know what? These are San Mateo residents, San Mateo employees, and also the most vulnerable in your community. So we're asking you today to look at the possibilities. What are the resources or the avenues? How do we work together? And I, I think we can say that today that we're here to work together to ensure that Seton Hospital is saved because lives will be saved. We have NUHW, we have CNA, we have all of these community members as well asking and looking to your leadership because without Seton Hospital, we will not have a community hospital. So we urge you up here to work with us and the community to, to find a way to save Seton Hospital. And basically, saving Seton Hospital saves lives. So saving Seton Hospital saves lives. Thank you. Mr. President, we have three speakers. Edgardo Alikoe, Hala Hijazi, and then George Tinetti. I am Dr. Edgardo Alikoe. I'm a neurologist at Seton Medical Center for 23 years. I am a first-generation Filipino immigrant. Given the chance, opportunity at Seton Medical Center to work there as a private practitioner, and I stayed because I think I belong here. Like the other people, I just want to impart to you that we are a center of excellence and Losing this program will be very detrimental to our county. I've been a program a stroke a director for, 20, for, for 12 years. I've been, I, I've been um, in, the internal, in internal medicine as chief, chief of medicine for, for a year. And I just want to tell you about our program which I love so much, it's, 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 it's the stroke program. We are a primary stroke center. Now, a stroke is a very bad disease to have. 160,000 people in the United States die of stroke every year. 800,000 new cases is the leading cause of disability. One out of 20 deaths is related to stroke, okay? percent of survivors will have limitation of mobility that will impact their daily life. 
We are a center that is giving the chance to our community to be able to minimize that impact of disability. But we have its time constraint. Brain is time from the start of stroke. Millions and millions of cells will die each minute. So patients should be there within the four and a half hour period, but we have to do tests within the one and a half hour period. Now, we are able to do these things higher than the benchmark in the country. The benchmark for doing a CAT scan from the time the patient goes to the emergency room is 20, 20 minutes. We do it in 10 minutes. Doctor, you need to wrap up. Yeah. So, so what I'm saying is time constraint. We need to save people. A lot of people who come over, 38% are, are, are walk-in patients who are treated for stroke. Okay? And we don't want to lose that. How, how, how can they have this care if they have to go far away to have their, their, their care taken? Gone. And, and uh, like I said, people die. And we want to keep our, our hospital. That's all it is. Paula Hajazi, followed by George Tinetti. Good evening. My name is Hala Hijazi and I serve on the Human Rights Commission in San Francisco and the Board of Directors of the San Francisco Interfaith Council. I can tell you that I was born somewhere else and came here and immigrated and Seton was our only hospital of choice. And for an immigrant that had language barriers, Seton was our number one and only choice. I can tell you I'm the oldest of six children and many of us had many emergencies that landed at Seton Hospital. But I'm here to tell you that Governor Gavin Newsom has declared a state of an emergency this afternoon in response to the coronavirus, coronavirus crisis. Public health events such as these pose a national security threat and priorities. This is not just a public health, but also a national security. Public health is key to the national security and well-being at home as well as abroad. SEED must be available to respond and equipped to deal with the known and unknowns. We need all the ICU beds and long-term care beds with ventilators possible. I urge you to work with Governor Newsom, AG Becerra, all of our senators to ensure a full operation of Seton Medical Hospital. Thank you. George Tinetti, followed by our last speaker, Mayor John Goodman from Colma. George today, and I've been working at Seton since 1971. My whole working life, 16 years old, was when I first hired. I'm speaking from the heart in this case. Barry says that they've been transparent with whatever they told us. That's about as a lie as you can get, as far as a lie you can go. We have nurses, we have people crying today because of what they heard from the board meeting that came out at both locations, Seton and Seton Coastside. I delivered the goods between both the hospitals and the other departments. I've been trying to uphold morally what they can feel as truth as being what I thought, that Barry was really trying to help us. Well, they're not trying to help us. They're our enemy at the same time as there's our paycheck person. They want their profit. That's what they want, bottom line. They tell us that they've been looking at different buyers. They've been telling people that they can put in a bid in May for some people. What the hell's going on here? I'm pissed off because of what happened today. You've got newspaper articles from the Chronicle, Examiner, and they're not even putting out the facts the way they're supposed to be putting them out. We're not a 350-bit hospital. No longer. What the hell? We're in a world that we need to be honest with you. Pull out the truth. Give us what's going on. We are people. All of us who work there. We're friends. We keep telling each other, hang in there. Hang in there every day. That's all we say to each other. No. But we got buried today saying they're going to close down in a week. That's crazy. Totally ludicrous. I am pissed 
off. This is wrong. We deserve better. We do what we can for our community. Help us get there. Slocum, Vice President David Canapa, San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. My name is John Goodwin. I'm the mayor of the town of Colma. Thank you for organizing this discussion tonight. I'd like to say thank you to Vice President Canapa, the Daly City Council, uh, union members and community members who have been on proactive on this issue even prior to the proposed sale of Seton Hospital. So a big thank you to everyone. Town. It's the smallest town that's in San Mateo, but we have a big heart. I don't know if anyone knows in here, I think David you know, but my vice mayor is in intensive care right now. Okay, we're down that one special council person, and uh, I, I, I hate the thought that if she was at Seton, that she would be moved to some of the location in the state of California away from the Bay Area. And let me tell you, this is not only for my council member, my vice mayor, this is for everyone that I think Verity doesn't understand that if you move them around the state of California, you won't have that support system that helps come, like the family members, the friends, they will not be able to go visit their family members, you know, in wherever, Southern California, Central California, whatever like that, so keep that in mind. I'm solution-oriented as well. We need solutions on this. I get it that the county doesn't have that much money. I get that. Let's go to the state, all right? We need to get the state involved on this. The coronavirus is here. It's a pandemic. It's worldwide, right? It's not going away, all right? Today at Costco, <laughs> I'm there. There's no toilet paper for sale, okay? There's not, all right? That's just the first sign, all right? I didn't even know that this hospital was actually like on its last days. I didn't know that coming in tonight. I had a nice long speech to try to save it. I still want to save this hospital. I still want to fight for this hospital like everyone else in this room right now. Let's go and ask the state for money if we have to, all right? If you can get out anything from San Mateo County, give it to Verity or give it to the bankruptcy court. I don't care. Keep this hospital going. We need to protect it. Yeah! Mr. Canepa, do you want to? Well, I want to thank uh, everyone for, for coming tonight and for everyone who um, provided testimony. Uh, the medical staff is, is really remarkable. Um, it's hard to imagine how hard, hard this is to be working at, at Seton right now. And all the speakers have made it very clear that there would be very serious, serious hardships if Seton closed. Uh, the loss of the long-term uh, skilled nursing beds, I, I think that's like 20% of our beds in the county. That's, that's a big deal. The uh, subacute folks. Um, I have a constituent, I'm from Burlingame, but I have a constituent that has a, a son who occupies one of those beds. So I learned a good deal about the subacute. And that's very, very, very difficult. Uh, as I said earlier, in, in, in so many respects, the root of this problem is our broken federal health system that doesn't pay providers uh, to treat these patients the, the, the funds that they need. And as you've heard, we're wrestling with that in our own system here in the county, facing $57 million deficit because of the low federal reimbursements and I actually foresee this uh, deficit growing. We're laying people off, so we face some. Uh, we face these same structural problems. But I, I, I leave the meeting tonight much more um, encouraged than I did coming because of the testimony about willing buyers, uh, about Dr. Perez's comments, and 
remarks that a deal could be made. Um, I think Barry has heard loud and clear that a deal needs to be made. And it, it, to my mind, not only does a deal need to be made, but a plan needs to be put in place so that Seton can prosper in, in the long, long term. Um, you know, this might not be popular to say, but I think there probably needs to be some relaxation of some of the Attorney General conditions. Um, I do think something else has to be done with the site, you know, with real estate development. Um, operators from the daughters on have, have struggled mightily. And, you know, ultimately, somehow, somehow the numbers have to add up. So it seems like the, it seems like there's, there's still hope here. And um, I feel more hopeful now than I did when I arrived. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pine. Um, I'm going to put the county manager on the spot, <laughs> but I'm going to get, but I'm going to give him a couple of seconds here to think about, think about it. But I'm just curious about, you know, Supervisor Pine said, uh, and a lot of speakers said, we need a plan. We need a plan. Um, I'm just curious that you've heard all the testimony and the concerns and the perspectives and. We've been involved with this for quite some time. I'm wondering about, I'm not quite clear on what that plan might be or how we get from here to there. And maybe you could help me understand that. Uh, th thank you, President uh, Slocum. Um, let me first say that, you know, I, I said this last time, I grew up in this community. Um, I went to Mary's Help, my family went to Mary's Help, and I know about the great service uh, and treatment that all these folks are talking about. Um, since 2013, this board has allocated uh, 40, almost $41 million uh, towards the preservation of Seton, and $8 million and some of that went to a seismic upgrade, another 300000 went to strategic planning, and then $25 million, over $25 million went to Medi-Cal services. And as you know, we're facing a health crisis not only in this county, but in, in throughout, the, throughout this country. And as Supervisor Pine said, we've got that $57 million deficit that we're looking at. And our health system has done a tremendous job trying to address that. Um, but we still have a long ways to go. We're $8 million short. We're using reserves for $8 million. And there's an assumption that we can raise $33 million in revenue to address our shortfall. And that is an incredible large assumption. Um, but we are trying, and we understand the, the value of service um, throughout this county and the necessity for services throughout this county. And that's why I've used, this board has made a capital investment in health care services time and time again in this county, and you continue to do so in Coeur d'Alaris and in the medical center and the South San Francisco clinic that, that, that will be built. All those are capital investments throughout this county. Um, I, you know, we are in a tough situation. It's not, in, and I know that a lot of people think it's the county and we have a lot of money, but we, we really don't. When you look at the, um, the unfunded liability that we're paying down and, and the contributions that we've had to adjust, a quarter point uh, 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 cost us $40 million this last year in, in contributions. $40 million when we gave the, the, the raises to our uh, employees in the health care services who so desperately needed it and deserved it, that was $17 million. When you talk about our debt limit, you know, we have a great strong credit rating right now of uh, AAA, AAA rating, um, but, you know, we're, we're getting towards the top of that. Our current debt outstanding is $531 million, a half a billion dollars in debt, which costs us $30 million over the next 10 years. We have no collateral left um, in the near future to, um, to negotiate with, and we've still got you know, to raise about $120 million for uh, the Cordilleras Mental Health Facility and North County Health Center. But I can say this, and I agree wholeheartedly with Supervisor Canepa, that Verity needs to sell this hospital to a hospital buyer. Um, and I would say with that in closing that, you know, we, you know, we could, um, be at that table and, and work with work with them to see if there is uh, some solution here. We do have uh, still some money set aside for seismic that if this board so chose, uh, we could certainly um, allocate towards Seton in some fashion. Um, 
So I would take uh, direction from the board on that, and uh, um, so instructed, I would come back with uh, with some type of uh, uh, plan. Thank you, Mr. County Manager. I'm just curious if you could just amplify on one point for me, just for my own understanding. You mentioned that uh, if you were directed by the board that we could work with the players involved. Is that right? Well, we would sit, uh, yes, we would sit down and, um, and see. Uh, I can tell you this, and, and this may um, be not what certainly many people in this crowd want to hear. We cannot afford to buy this hospital. We just can't afford to buy it. Um, we are, you know, like I said, we've got a $57 million deficit that we are, uh, it's a structural deficit that we have got to solve to keep our operations. And we're cutting operations and we're laying people off. Um, and we're trying our best to maintain services. But to the extent there is a, a, a smaller part that we can play, I mean, I, that would be something that, you know, um, we could bring back to the board if the, if the board was interested in that. Thank you. Um, let me just thank um, Supervisor Canapa, Vice President Canapa, uh, for his leadership on this issue. I know he's spent countless hours uh, working this issue, and I know um, he's just a, a tireless advocate for this community and for Seton, and uh, I think he's helped educate all five of us uh, about um, this topic, and we appreciate Supervisor, your leadership, and thank you for bringing us all here to Daly City. Great. Thank you. First of all, let me just thank you um, personally on a personal level. Um, first of all, for being here. Thank you, Supervisor Pine, for being here. Showing up means a lot, and uh, I want to thank you especially, you know, your staff. Um, we're on the verge of shutting down. And I can't get that out of my mind. We've been talking about buyers for forever. Now we, you know, we hear there's another buyer. I think, and I hate to say this with all due respect, and I, I, I thank staff for being here. It's really truly the tale of two counties. You know, I got an email um, the other day, and what the email said, and, I, and I've heard, I talked to a lot of you folks, is that some of you feel forgotten. You feel forgotten. And, you know, it pains me that we always feel like we're not getting ours, but I think there's a couple solutions I think the board warrants consideration. Um, you can't put a price on people's health. You just can't. And us not having this hospital would stress the system, but in addition, um, in addition, Sorry about that. Um, in addition, I have several options that I want to propose to the board and hopefully provide direction uh, to the county manager. One, I think we should explore um, the county um, acquiring the hospital. And I think we should do it as uh, Santa Clara County had done. I know you had, you're nodding your head there. We should do that. We should look at lease revenue bonds. So I think that's critical. One, I think we should look at a partnership um, with the buyer uh, to help financing. I want to understand um, in greater detail, and you said, Mr. Kelly, that you'd like to sit down with the potential buyer and seller. What is the gap that we're looking at? And what is the role that the county can play in filling that gap? Yeah. The other thing is I want to thank the city of Daly City. I want to thank the mayor. I want to thank the city council. I want to thank Justin Manalo. I want to thank Pam DiGiovanni. And I want to thank the Coma mayor, town of Coma mayor, um, for your comments. I see Assemblymember Phil Ting's office here and um, Scott Wieners here. You know, I think we really want to make this to make this work. I think we're interested, and not to speak on, on behalf of the council, but we're interested in seeing what we can do to utilize the land so that it works outside of, you know, it just being. Um, a, an acute care hospital. I want to talk a little bit about funding sources that are worth consideration. Measure A was passed specifically for health care. That became Measure, measure K. 
the dollars that were being referred to, you know, in 2017, when I was on the board, we approved um, $15 million, and that was for seismic. Of those dollars that are left, there, it's $6.9 million. I gotta be quite frank with you, $6.9 million is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money. We need to look at Measure K dollars uh, to potentially um, help fund this. The other thing is we need to really look at um, our ERAF dollars. I know there's been you know, some adjustment, but these are sort of the funding sources that we need to look at. We need to be creative. Now, there are some folks, and you know, I understand it. You know, every time I travel to Redwood City, it's like going to a different world. You know, y'all, we grew up here, right? We grew up next to San Francisco, Colma, South City. And, um, you know, it's just different because we're, you know, we're from here. And so I see what the hospital means. And I just want to share with you a couple stories. Um, the first story is, um, you know, my wife, my wife had said to me, you know, I always see all the elderly people getting off the bus. And they get off the bus because whether they're getting you know, they're getting, you know, care at the hospital, but it really does, does serve the elderly. You know, we talk about the Medi-Cal and Medicare. I mean, we have a responsibility as a county to take care of those people. We do, and we do that in our medical center, and that we should take that responsibility on. And I'll just tell you a couple other stories. Um, my grandmother was recently um, in the hospital. Uh, she's 94 uh, years old. I forgot our doctor, I wanna say Coleman Ryan, but it's not Coleman Ryan. Um, but one of the doctors said, said if she didn't go to Seton, it could have been much, 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 much worse. And she stayed there for three days. And so when we talk about numbers and we talk about finances, that's important. But what we really have to think about is the people behind that. And sometimes we get, look, we, we get lost in that. So I'm going to ask for the following, um, and again, it's, 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 at the, it's at the will of the board, um, the direction of the board. Um, I'd like us to look um, at the, the acquisition of the hospital, partnership with the buyer um, to help with the financing, um, to continue to work with um, Daly City uh, on the land use. Um, I want to look at the funding sources, whether it's through Measure K dollars, ERAF funds, or um, or, or the general fund. And so I think it's important. I think this community uh, deserves it. And, you know, if we don't do that, I think it's really a disservice. And it sort of reinforces the stereotypes that I've heard of us being forgotten in North San Mateo County. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Camp. I'm uh, going to ask our county council a question now. Um, unfortunately, two board members couldn't be here right. um, tonight uh, because of illness, uh, not, not the virus, uh, just pretty sick. Um, but I'm curious uh, about how we... Got a quorum. No, sorry. We, ha we do have a quorum, but how do we involve them in this conversation? Do we have a closed session? What's that process look like? Well, it, it, you can certainly decide to uh, agendize a discussion uh, at a future board meeting when all five are present and have a, have a discussion about whether you want to agendize a future discussion or action on Seton. So you can wait until all five are present at a, at a near future meeting to have that very discussion about what is the will of the board to direct the county manager and staff. Through county council? Yeah. But we also have... Um, there's a, we have three members, correct? Sure. So, and so the three members, correct me if I'm wrong, three members can provide direction because we have a quorum, right? Is that correct? That's correct, but I, I was okay. answering okay. Supervisor uh, President okay. Slocum's question. Thank you. So, right. So today, of course, as, as everyone knows, this is a discussion um, uh, only agenda today. Is this, is, this is a study session. So per the Brown Act, no you know, substantive uh, action uh, on scene can be taken tonight. Um, but what you may do, um, per, the, per the Brown Act, um, if there's the rule of yeah. three members uh, tonight, um, sort of as a procedural housekeeping matter, 
um, you may take action uh, with three votes, there's three members here tonight, uh, to direct staff yeah. to place a, a specific matter on a future agenda for discussion or action. So if there's a consensus of three board members to, to direct yeah. staff to bring back a, 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 an agenda, you may. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Supervisor Pines, did you want to comment on that at all? Or if not, that's okay. No, I, I would certainly um, think um, we need to, we should have the five of us here and we're, the meeting is in six days and we should talk about it at that time. So I think, excuse me, hold on one second. I think one of the issues, Supervisor Pine, thank you very much. I appreciate the audience's feedback, is that the hospital is going to probably close on Monday. And so that's our, you know, that's our, not, not on, it'll, it has to go through court proceedings, but um, that they may take action on Monday um, to, to, to close the hospital. So the sensitivity of this is um, time sensitive. So if I may, if I may offer um, something up, because we don't have, um, and it, it's not an agendized item, right. but one of the things that I would suggest that I do, we do because of the, the sensitivity of the matter is that potentially um, the board um, can meet um, an emergency meeting. That'd be good. Would well, that be awesome, right? Um, and maybe what we can do is we can schedule that meeting um, and then with whatever direction we provide today, um, that would be sort of the, um, what would be discussed. And I think I've outlined what I'm interested um, at, about talking about um, on the agenda and making it an agendized item. Thank you for that. What, when would that emergency meeting take place, do you reckon? I, th I think the uh, I think what we're talking about um, is, is a special meeting of the yeah. board, which would require 24 hours notice. Hours notice. Yes. A, a special meeting of the board requires a 24-hour notice. So, supervisor, what? You know what we can do. Um, what we can do at the pleasure of the board, uh, considering that there is possible closure. What I would suggest is that we take this item up um, on Friday, um, and then possibly at this location, just so it's easier for people to, to get to. It's hard to get to Redwood City after, after work. So um, that's my, my suggestion, Friday at a, a time that's convenient for folks. I second the motion. <laughs> you cannot. Thank you. Uh, so, so um, go ahead. Look, I need you want me to provide clear direction. Yeah. Um, so what I, I suggest we do is that um, you know, we meet on Friday. Um, so do you guys meet or do we get to come? You get to come too. Oh. It's an open meeting. Why don't we meet Friday at 6 p.m.? Yeah. If that's at the direction of the board, um, that'd be much appreciated. And do we need a motion and a you know, vote on that, a roll call? Or? The board would need, would need to take action to direct staff. So, all right, so um, does anyone have a, a calendar? Um, so, I move that on um, Friday, March 4th, that we have a special. Uh, I'm sorry, Mark, not March 6th. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that, you know, I make a motion that we move. Um, uh, you know, I make a motion that we have a meeting, a special meeting on March 6th, um, here at 6 p.m. at Daly City City Hall. Um, to discuss the following items which, which I outlined. Um, and I'll read them again. Um, the acquisition of the hospital by the county, a partnership with the buyer to help um, with the financing. And the third thing to discuss is to work with the city of Daly City um, on land use. What about the state? Yeah, that's the motion on the table. Can I, yeah. can I ask you a question, yeah. Supervisor? I'm just curious about, I, I, I unfortunately didn't read or didn't know that, the, that there was this imminent closing, and I'm not, not disputing that. I just didn't know about it, so it's a surprise. Um, but in any case, thank you. Um, I'm curious that your, your thinking helped me understand. We're not going to be able to allocate money by, you know, by Tuesday or whatever the closing date that what, what you I, what mentioned I mean, was. What I'm interested in is yes. how we can uh, potentially sit down with a uh, buyer and seller, provide direction, understand what the gap funding is, um, 
between pulling this, um, putting this deal together, and that's that's critical. Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll second. I'll second that motion. Okay. I'll third the motion. All those in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> those opposed. Motion carries without objection. Thank you all. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.